Okay, so we're recording now. So, can, yeah, can you just paint a picture to me about the time you joined the reserve, maybe what it was like, the reserve itself, and then we'll go on to Cyprus from there. Okay. But, just, but just the actual reserve when you joined. Sure. So, um, so uh, I joined the uh, reserves in 1988. So I made the decision the, fall the previous summer. So that would have been the summer of 87. I was kind of thinking, you know, I wanted, a, wanted an adventure, had no idea that the Army Reserve or the militia even existed. And, uh, and uh, it took a bit of scrutiny. I even grabbed the yellow pages and started looking and, and all that. And I found recruiting. So I went to the, rec the recruiting center for the regular army. I said, well, do you have a reserve army? You know? And the reason I said that is because I had previously saw on, on U.S. cable a uh, recruiting ad for the U.S. Army Reserve. I thought there's got to be something like that in Canada. So I joined, uh, but, it, but it was complicated because I actually had to find it. And the recruiter had no idea what I was talking about. And uh, so we went through that for a bit. Uh, and finally, somebody said, oh, you want the militia. Okay, sure, I guess I want the militia. I had no idea what the militia was. And eventually I uh, found my way to the Griesbaugh Armory in Edmonton. Uh, where, the, where the Northern Alberta Militia District was, the recruiting officer was there, and a uh, crusty old guy in his mid-50s, oldest second lieutenant in NATO, as, as he liked to call himself. And uh, we, he gave me the various pieces of information, and, and the thing that jumped out at me was Loyal Edmonton Regiment, because uh, it, it had a parachute uh, role. And as a young guy, I was uh, uh, 18, turning 19 at the time, thinking, hey, this could be pretty fun. So, that, so I ended up signing up that year, and enrolling in March of 88. And then off I went off onto officer training. Now I was a university student. So, uh, so during that time, uh, it was a guaranteed summer job and a part-time job over the, uh, over the uh, winter months while I was at school at the University of Alberta. And at that time, what, what was sort of the most you could do operationally um, to challenge yourself as, as a reserve soldier, as a reserve officer. Yeah, certainly. So, so I, I joined as an officer, as an officer cadet, and got commissioned like within the year uh, once I finished my officer training. And at the time, as a for a reservist, there was nothing. Like, you, you, you did your summer training. Uh, you'd, you'd be able to do bar parachute training because it, we were a parachute task unit. So that was good. And uh, so th there, there wasn't a lot of uh, emphasis for reservists to deploy anywhere. And remember, operational deployments back then were few and far between, even for the regular army. So, you know, the, 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 the cool uh, mission was a peacekeeping mission in Cyprus. That's where most uh, regular army soldiers got to go. In, uh, in the same year that I joined, uh, was one of the first years that reservists got to deploy to Cyprus. And, and, uh, and because uh, reserves weren't well in integrated into, into the training with the regular army, it was, uh, they, there was a lot of uh, obstacles and, and actually really gateway checks uh, to make sure that reservists were up to speed for the training. But they would only take junior ranks, so, uh, so that, uh, and, and master corpor corporals rarely. They basically wanted corporals. And uh, so that, that was the first year, I think that was 1988, and a couple of years after that, they started getting more confidence, uh, recognizing that reservists could actually do the task. And uh, so it was a couple of years later when I, when I raised my hand, when it became apparent that the opportunity was coming wider. And I learned of three vacancies for, for junior officers to deploy. And as soon as I heard that, I went to see my op staff, uh, the regular force uh, captain at the time, and said, I really want to go. Is there any way I can uh, get my name submitted? And uh, to his credit, uh, he, uh, he picked up the phone and uh, burned the lines and figured out how to do it. So take me through that process. So you volunteered to go to Cyprus. What, what happens after you get picked up to do it? What are you doing for workup training? Sure. So, uh, so I, it, this would have been uh, like the summer of 1990 when I heard the rumors. There was not, you know, there was no formal notices. It was mostly just pay attention and talk to people. And uh, th then uh, in the fall, the actual call for uh, uh, for for uh, people to to deploy came out for the reserves, and they there was three slots. So, um, so once I, uh, I, I told the op, so he, he contacted the battalion and the CO of the battalion uh, knew that many reserve officers were going to want to take these three tasks and there was probably a dozens uh, that uh, were interested in applying. So, uh, so the CO at the time 
uh, uh, Colonel Romsey's, uh, said basically, well, I need something to go on to choose these guys. Let's do the old school resume. And uh, so fill out a resume and, resume and write an essay as to why you want to deploy. So that's what I did in old school longhand. So it was a, it was a, it was a, a two-page essay as to why I wanted to go and uh, what I thought I could learn and uh, put, to, put together a resume which, which at the ripe old age of 19 years old was, didn't take more than half a page. You were 19 then? Yeah. 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 Oh, no, that's not true. Uh, I was actually 21 at the time. Yeah, I joined when I was 19. So I, was, uh, so I raised my hand to deploy at 21, and by the time we got out the door in, uh, in early February of 1991, I was 22. Almost like entering a contest. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it was. So I, and, and yeah, in fact, put in your letter, hope for the best. And, uh, and, and, you know, you had to have some references, and obviously the CO would have to put in a good word for you and all that sort of thing. So it was a, it was a, it was a paper competition. Uh, I don't really know what the number of people that, uh, that had actually applied, so I don't really know what the odds of my winning were. It could have been us only three, for all I know. But, uh, but it was still a hoop that you had to go through. You weren't simply tapped on the shoulder and said, time for you to go and deploy. So, uh, so, so that happened uh, in, uh, all that happened in the late fall, right before the Christmas uh, uh, block leave. And, uh, come Jan and I was confirmed that I would be going right before Christmas. So uh, it worked out well. I was still a student at university, so I was able to give no notice to, the, to uh, my, my professors. I had one course that was a full year course. Everything else were half year courses, so I was able to withdraw from the fall uh, winter session for, uh, at the U of A. And, uh, and then reported for training in, uh, in January of 1991, and we did 30 days of workup training. So how did the people, it sounds like when you were speaking initially, you're not from a military family. Not at all. So how did your family react to the fact that you, A, joined the militia, and B, you were now asking to go overseas? Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was, you know, they're, they're very supportive. My, uh, my, um, my mom uh, wasn't quite sure about this whole thing. Uh, she uh, did, you know, her she remembered the, the early days of the, the, like World War II. She was a child in World War II, so she doesn't really me remember much of the war, but she remembers all the stories of her father uh, having gone to war and that sort of thing. So I well, know my grandmother was rather stressed out about it. Uh, my dad was totally okay with it. He thought it, would, uh, he thought it was a, a, a good adventure for me, a good thing for me to do. He, uh, when I told him I was interested in joining the militia, he made a point of saying, well, I, I think you should join as an officer. And, uh, and by that time, I was a university student, and he, uh, he being uh, from Austria, uh, kind of understood how the military rank system would work, and, and he, he had uh, grown up during the war as well, so he understood how all of that worked. And so, um, so I followed his advice on that point. And, uh, and it really was never an issue. In fact, when I de deployed to Cyprus, uh, when I had my, uh, my home leave, rather than flying home, I flew my dad into Cyprus, and we went on leave together. If I forget, I want to ask about that as we get to Yeah, that certainly. So you talked about um, the perception on your mom or your, your grandmother going to war, but how did you, did, did you view it as going to war? How, what was your perception at the time? Yeah, not in the slightest. Not in the, I, I, I never considered it was as a particularly dangerous uh, assignment or a dangerous task. So I never viewed it as going to war. It was really more of a, I'm going to go on an adventure, and what a great adventure this could be. And, uh, and that's probably the attitude of every young man who, who's in uniform. And, uh, in, and in this case, it was, uh, it was certainly adv adventurous. It, and I was, you know, plowing new ground. It was, I was part of a group of literally the first officers to deploy uh, and get a command position to go to Cyprus at the time. So it was more than just an adventure. I was, I was kind of pushing the om envelope to for the stuff that I was doing. Only 30 days of workup training, yeah. which seems incredible today. What, what did you do in those 30 days? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question because, as I mentioned, it was early days of, uh, of reserves uh, being integrated into deployments. And uh, so what they did is they gathered all the reservists and said, okay, here's the things that we want to make sure that you guys are skilled on uh, before we deploy. And at that time, the C7 service rifle 
uh, came into effect and was getting rolled out into the uh, militia units. All the regular army units had this had the C7, uh, but the, most of the militia regiments only had the old the FN. And uh, so the troops were all learning, uh, learning the weapon system, basically, uh, learning the rifle, et cetera. And I was put in with that training, although, uh, and, and simply it's, it was, well, you know, you're, you come from the reserves, you should need to take this rifle training too, because you don't know anything about the rifle. And, uh, but in my case, it was different, because my officer training was completely integrated in with the regular army. And so I, I had never learned on the FN. In fact, I only knew the C7. So, uh, so once I pointed that, that out, I, I had a lot, whole bunch of people scratching their heads as, well, what are we going to do with the lieutenant from the Loyal Edmonton Regiment? And, uh, and, and, I, and I, started pre I started pushing back and said, well, you know, I can sleep in the back of the classroom while all the lectures are going on about the C7, and then I'll still pass all the, all the, all the weapons tests, the TOETs. Or how about I sit in the company headquarters and you guys teach me about all the how company ops are supposed to work so that I can actually command a platoon effectively. I actually had to say that. And, uh, and, uh, and after a, a day or two of going back and forth, it's like, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. So, uh, so I sat down with the uh, company 2IC and the company, uh, uh, company administration officer and, we, and they sat down and said, okay, well in the regular army we do these things like for personnel administration, these are the things, this is the planning, that sort of stuff. None of which I had learned as a, as a reserve officer. And then I started just asking lots of questions, and then they realized, oh, okay, this is the stuff that we really need to teach you as a reservist coming into a regular army uh, battalion. I just want to be absolutely clear, this 30 days, is this 30 days just for the reservists, or is this the entire battalion is doing 30 days of work of training? Yeah. Yeah, so my experience was obviously with the reserves within the battalion, but the entire battalion was really only doing 30 days because they just got back from fall X, uh, in the uh, in the fall, and uh, so then so then after Christmas block leave, then they just focus on the, the training for Cyprus. So it, really, the whole battalion was only do, doing thirty days of workup training, and and off we, we went. And and really, the workup training the battalion did was pretty nominal. It was simply just skill sets. Uh, uh, they didn't have rules of engagement in those days, but they had various various checklists and things that they had to do and had to know as a UN peacekeeper. So, so really, they viewed the task, the UN peacekeeping task, as just another task, and uh, and they're fully ramped up and ready to go. So that was the, the general perception of it. So, what do you think of that attitude when you look back at it from the vantage point of today? Yeah. So, well, yeah. So, looking over, over history, I think it's a good attitude to have, and because in essence, first of all, the regular army battalions were much larger back then. Uh, more robust in, in terms of equipment and personnel. And also uh, the, the, uh, the regular army battalions, the training that they did was in much more intense because it was still Cold War training, you'd still go to Europe occasionally. Um, all of that, uh, the, the, very, the reserve, uh, no, the, even the regular army training was, was pretty big, like there were brigade level exercises. And it's been a while since we've actually had lots of brigade level exercises. Back then a brigade level exercise happened every single year. So their, their readiness was always high anyway. So looking back on it over the years, I actually think that we had a much more effective standing army back then than we do today. And, uh, and the premise of having to do 90 days of workup training to go on an operation sort of begs the question about the state of readiness of, the, of our standing army. How, do you have any, any idea how many reservists there were in total with uh, the battalion and, and how were they received? Right, so, so the, I can't give you an exact number, but uh, more than half of the soldiers, the corporals and privates uh, in one company were uh, were reservists, and uh, there were no N no reserve NCOs, and there were three reserve junior officers, subalterns, all lieutenants. So uh, so I would say, you know, you could probably estimate about eighty to ninety reserves in the, in the battalion, and uh, and of course we were structured into two companies. So you had a city company and a rural company, and all the reserves were in rural company. And 
on on your arrival to the first battalion how how were you and the rest of them received by the regular force well a lot of a lot of it with just kind of okay who are these guys uh we train them in very summer training so some of it was looking down your nose at it because you know you guys aren't really as well trained as us there was that cultural uh, piece in those early days uh the uh, the the right the uh, the regular army uh, uh, junior officers were more than welcoming. Uh, many of them I had trained with, so they're more. They're, so from at an officer level, it was never much of an issue, but certainly at the soldier level, there was uh, there was that attitude that the that the reserve soldier wasn't as well trained, was, wasn't as knowledgeable as the regular army soldier. Might might have been the case in certain kinds of skill sets. Obviously, anything to do with a mechanized vehicle or a, or an anti-tank system or that sort, that sort of thing, reserves were like we had no idea how to use that stuff. But when it came down to basic infantry skills, yeah, we're we're do, we were doing just fine, and that was eventually recognized. Uh, it was never uh, it was never an animosity. It was just kind of like, who are these guys? It was early days still for uh, for reserve integration into uh, any sort of operation. So. Uh, expectations before you before you hit the ground. What are you expecting Cyprus to be like? Yeah, well, I, um, I I had the benefit of having met a number of guys that had been to Cyprus, and many of them would would tell various stories. I found it interesting that not a single story from Cyprus involved anything of a military nature, and uh, more of them they more often than not they involved a bunch of funny stories of going to the beach or uh, guys carousing around in the evening that sort of thing. But uh, nothing, uh, nothing of a soldierly nature. I was wondering, well, you know, is there, is there any, any action? Like, what is it? And uh, so, so I, I went there thinking, ah, it's probably going to be pretty quiet. Uh, that expectation was met. Uh, the, uh, but aside from that, I didn't really have anything to, to measure. So I didn't really know what I was really getting into. And uh, I know I was going to a place that was an established theater of operations. So, uh, so I wasn't expecting a lot of turmoil or anything like that. I, I, was, ex I was more expecting, uh, I was expecting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the tension between the two armies to be higher than it really was. And I'm referring to the Turkish Cypriots and the uh, Greek Cypriots, Cypriots. But as it turned out, it wasn't, not at all. What about uh, any, what kind of pressure, if any, did you put in yourself as you're getting ready as a bit of a trailblazer as a reserve platoon commander with this, the 1st Battalion? Yeah, actually, that, that's, uh, that's, that's a great question because there is one thing that, uh, that I, I come hell or high water had to happen, and that was uh, I wanted to deploy, to deploy as a platoon commander. So there were two platoon commander positions, and there were three uh, lieutenants from the reserves. And, one of them, one of the, and the third position was a duty officer position at the battalion headquarters. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not giving up uh, a year of school uh, just to go and sit in a, in a CP and, uh, and to uh, make notes into a logbook. Like, I want to go command, and I want to command the platoon. So that, that was the pressure that I put on myself because it, wasn't, it was uncertain as to which of the three would take command of the platoon as soon as we arrived. So that 30 days of workup training was part of it. Uh, uh, for the uh, for the leadership to determine which of the two of us would take command positions and who would do the duty officer position, so uh, so I, I was I felt I was under a bit of pressure uh, in the workup training to do that and to get that I, and I ended up pulling it off and I got to be, got to command one of the platoons and uh, you know was it a prize I don't I don't really know I don't even know if they uh, if they were if the battalion was thinking in those terms or I'd already predetermined that uh, these two guys would take the platoon and this guy would do the to the, uh, be at the battalion headquarters, but uh, I, that was a goal I wanted to have, and uh, and 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 uh, and I got that. Another interesting story is when the day before we left, uh, my contract had to revert from being a reservist on a class B to uh, to a class C contract, which is the equivalent of regular army co contract. So so the contract gets in the old old school with the telexes and that sort of thing gets sent to us. And uh, and it had uh, had me as second lieutenant, and uh, and I was irate, uh, and I'm like, well, I, I I'm a lieutenant, you know, there's a problem here, and and uh, the officers at the time uh, said, well, you, you know, we can fix it later, et cetera, and you know, just sign here and we'll go, and I realized, oh, I'm in a, I have an opportunity to force a force an issue, so I I forced it, and I said, well, no. Um, 
you, if you need me to deploy tomorrow, you can have, give me a contract that says lieutenant on it. Otherwise, I'm not going. And, uh, and this caused a great deal of consternation and had me up in front of the, uh, the adjutant of the unit and he explained the facts of life to me and I explained the fact that until such time as I signed a contract, I would be driving home tomorrow. And uh, that, was, uh, that was really quite funny. And uh, so that was the morning and by one o'clock in the afternoon, a uh, new message was cut with lieutenant on it. And then, then I deployed. Why was that so important to you? Why, why couldn't you just wait? Money. So, uh, so the second lieutenant pay was a fraction of the lieutenant pay. And, uh, and the other part of it too was uh, I, um, I had my doubts as to whether or not it would actually happen. I, I, by that time, I'd been in the reserves long enough to, to see that you know, a verbal promise made, made to me is not the, same as, uh, not the same as something actually following through. So, and not that I was distrustful of the guys in the battalion, but uh, whether or not they could actually influence the decision that actually happens at NDHQ uh, would remain to be seen. It certainly wouldn't happen if I was already deployed because there'd be no motivation for anybody in the NDHQ to fix it. So I wouldn't allow the problem to exist in the first place. First impressions of Cyprus when you get there. What's it like for the kid from Edmonton? Yeah, well the weather was nice. So we deployed in February. It wasn't as nice as I thought it would be. It was still kind of cool. We got there in the middle of the night and, uh, and we were supposed to, to deploy to different locations and, uh, and somehow uh, where I was supposed to go to, uh, to the Ortona house, uh, which was on the outskirts of Nicosia, my platoon wound up at Camp Berge, which is the furthest uh, outpost out. That, uh, so all of the planning, all of my, all of my reconnaissance, my map reccees, all of, all of that was thrown out the window. And we just basically got off the, uh, got off the trucks and walked into Berge and, uh, and like, well, this isn't where we thought we would be. And uh, so there was, a, there was a lot of phone calls back and forth and okay, well, we're here now, so uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll rotate in and figure out the rest later. So, uh, so it was a bit of a chaos. It wasn't, it wasn't the best deployment. And, but at the end of the day, it worked pretty straightforward. My impression of Cyprus was, was uh, you know, a very beautiful uh, Mediterranean style uh, island. It was, uh, it was like going back in time a bit. It was very, uh, very slow lifestyle. But you know, in the daytime when you uh, when you, we actually we were in a very rural area, so it was all you know, um, uh, uh, shepherds, flocks, very hot uh, in the in the middle of the afternoon, very cool in the evening, uh, very typical kind of uh, rural lifestyle in uh, in the Mediterranean. Where did, what about just your, the basics of your accommodations? Like who did you take over from and wh where did you live? So I um, just want to think, we took over from 12 RBC. And uh, we were in a small camp, my platoon. Uh, so my platoon actually had two camps, uh, Camp Berger, which was in Laura Gina, which is the there was a, the Turkish uh, uh, side had a salient that pushed down south to a little village called Origina, and our camp was there. And then the green zone was all, was all around it with the Greeks on three sides and the Turks on the northern portion. And then we also had a section house uh, up uh, further down the green line, uh, very near to, a, to an OP. So, um, so the camp was actually quite well established. There were, uh, were like wooden huts and uh, and the camp was under, undergoing some construction for improvements, so we ended up having a very nice building uh, as, a, uh, as both quarters and uh, like a recreation room uh, while we were there. So, the, you know, the accommodations were nothing bad. Uh, there was no air conditioning, so that was one thing that we were coveting. Uh, most other camps had air conditioning, and we definitely, by the time uh, April rolled along, we were looking forward to air conditioning, and by the time July rolled along, we were desperate for air conditioning. And, uh, but, it, but everything else was just perfectly fine. We had a, we had a kitchen. Uh, the battalion uh, had a debt of the uh, UMS actually at my location. Uh, so they were located with me with, a, with a, uh, 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 an ambulance vehicle. And, uh, and we also had some logistical vehicles. So it wasn't just a platoon, it was actually a platoon plus that we were at. Um, camp staff were all the locals from the, from the village. 
that uh, basically became like part of the family. And uh, so two of my sections were there. I had a section at the section house and I also had a section in the force reserve. And uh, so the battalion had a force reserve platoon. And, uh, and the intent was uh, the rural, that rural company would, would, have, would be responsible for the force reserve platoon. So what we did, rather than rotate platoons through all the various sectors, we rotated our, se our sections into force reserve and then back. So I act my platoon was actually a four platoon platoon as opposed to three. And one section was, was detached to a platoon commander of the force reserve platoon. And then we'd rotate sections back into reserve, in the forest reserve. And that allowed my platoon to stay in the same location for the entire six months. And that was, that was unusual. Normally, you'd spend two months in a location and then, and then everybody would move like left to right and in a big circle. And you only got to know your area for two months. So just as you start to understand the people and the, uh, and the issues around that sector, then you'd pack up and move. And uh, I was one of the advocates to say, to say maybe we should stop doing that. And a couple of the other platoon commanders uh, were, were advocating as well, saying, why don't we just stay in our locations for the whole time and rotate the troops in, in and out of reserve. So this way we, as platoon commanders and the leadership, would actually get to know our sectors. So what, what would your sections, what would, what would they be doing, sort of typical tasks on this, on this mission? So, uh, so this uh, Cyprus is a, was a classical peacekeeping tour. So, uh, so you had two armies that had decided to uh, stop fighting with each other, and they had come ter come to terms with the ceasefire agreement. So, our job was to make sure the terms of that ceasefire agreement were being adhered to. So, we had the green zone, uh, which was essentially the the uh, the front and 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 the no man's land in between the the uh, the forward positions of the two opposing factions. And uh, so our job was both to mo monitor the activities on the Green Line to make sure there weren't any troop incursions into the UN buffer zone or anything like that, but also to do occasional inspections of, of their defensive positions. So we, uh, so we had OPs scattered throughout, so a section would typically rotate their troops uh, uh, in and out of the OP, uh, and all they simply, simply did was sit there, watch their arcs, Look for mon uh, look for any sort of movement of a military nature, and uh, and then radio it in if they saw anything. And you know it was rare if ever it happened. Then um, and then uh, my section commanders uh, would take patrol duties, and and they would vi visit the various positions and do ins do site inspections. And uh, and back then everything was was very old school in the sense that. Uh, you didn't use anything of technology to do your monitoring, so it was um, it was binoculars, compass, map, and sketches. So uh, to compare the way the defensive positions w were, uh, soldiers that had the capability to draw a sketch drew sketches, and that was their job. And uh, so some were very artistic, and they were able to actually d uh, depict some pretty accurate uh, 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 sites. And, um, and literally, we had a binder that consisted of all those sketches of the defensive positions so that we could then check back to see if they were being improved or if they were moving equipment into areas or um, particularly machine gun positions, that sort of thing. And, um, and then uh, and if we noticed that there was a discrepancy, we, we would take the local commander to task and f either insist that he dismantle the system or, um, or explain and prove to us that it's been there for any length of time. So, uh, so the days of taking a picture, that, they were abs that, was, that was forbidden. We weren't, you weren't allowed to take a picture anywhere along the, the green zone. It was uh, against the agreement. So, uh, and you'd get accused of being a spy or something like that. So uh, we were all very careful not to take pictures, so we just sketched everything. And uh, knowing with uh, cell phones nowadays, I'm not sure that that would ever be enforceable again. You said uh, you know you expected a low key time, and that's what you got. Uh, but was there a day, an incident that sticks out in your mind as being particularly yeah memorable? yeah? There's th th there were a couple. Um, uh, one of the uh, one of the particular ones was uh, that in hindsight uh, I learned a lot of good lessons from. So I'll explain that in a sec. The uh, so my uh, as I mentioned. Our uh, section commanders would ins uh, inspect positions and take the local commander to task if they thought, s thought they saw an improvement. And, uh, and they found uh, fresh digging 
uh, along the side of a hill near near the front, near an OP. And uh, and it looked like it was the beginnings of, of either a trench or a uh, or um, or something to uh, to set up like a, another machine gun position or something like that, or even or even just a bunker. And uh, but it was all you know there was, it, it was it was relatively shallow, and the digging was it was literally a day or two old. And uh, so he flagged that. And we were uh, and 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 brought it back to my attention. And uh, not being on the ground, you know, it's like okay, well, we'll report that in, and we'll we'll, uh, we'll go and inspect and, and insist that they don't do any more improvements. So they did that, and and we did that, and uh, and the Greeks said, well, we don't know what you're talking about. This is you know, this has always been like this. It's you know, and we'd show them that it was fresh digging, etc. And 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 it got quite intransigent. Then I then I was pulled into a to an old group at the company level, so I wasn't on the ground at the time. But the section commander basically said, hey, they're doing even more stuff. Uh, you know, we should do something about this. And um, and uh, so I went down and saw it and saw that they were actually you know there was more improvements that sort of thing, and uh, uh, in the sense that the, the hole was a little bit deep it was really a hole the hole was deeper you know so a hole and the hole was deeper so uh, so I'm like uh, and I was kind of young and I was I was getting egged on uh, a bit by the uh, by by the section commander thinking that there was more to it and that we should really take them to task so I I reported it up and we we ended up. Calling in the uh, uh, the ferret scout cars and had them there just to say, "Hey, we we mean it, you know, stop doing this kind of thing." And then we just had them parked at our uh, at our camp and made sure that the Greeks saw that we had brought in these uh, these uh, armored vehicles, and uh, just as a point of symbolism, that was nothing more than that. And uh, and then eventually uh, the Greeks uh, finally said, "Okay, we'll fill in the hole." So we filled in the hole, and that was the the extent of the drama. I then later learned through a casual conversation with the Greek commander that he was kind of embarrassed about the whole thing because what it was was it was a cold windy night and the guy on OP was cold wanted to get out of the get out of the wind so he dug himself a shell scrape so he could lie down and go to sleep and get out of the wind <laughs> so uh, so you know we were we were inadvertently escalating something that was entirely benign and that was the thing that I learned pretty quickly which is you know, uh, you don't need to escalate everything. Take things slowly uh, when your job is there. There is to keep the peace. Like, uh, especially when you're a peacekeeper, you don't want to be the cause of the escalation. What about a what about a story, an incident that wasn't uh, military related? As you said, most Cyprus stories are. Have you got one of those? Uh, yeah, let me think about a couple of them. I'll tell them in a, an interesting way. So. Um, Yeah. Uh, so one one thing that we would do is uh, we had uh, a fleet of jeeps, and these jeeps were called pajeros. They're made by Mitsubishi, and they're brand new. and And uh, the army was on a tight budget, and they didn't want us to wreck these vehicles, so they gave us all limited mileage. So you're only so as a platoon platoon, I had had X number of kilometers that I was able to use each month. Didn't matter which vehicle I used them on, but I had a total. I couldn't exceed that total of kilometers. So, so, so that ensured that you're, you know, ma uh, optimizing your patrolling, and you weren't using, you weren't uh, driving the vehicles into the ground unnecessarily. So, because my sector was unusually large, I had a lot of kilometers, and uh, and I came up with a pretty efficient and effective patrolling plan. And actually, I didn't come up with it. That my my platoon two IC and my section commanders did. And, uh, and uh, they were very motivated too because they quickly realized that the excess kilometers could be used for, uh, for quick trips out to the beach at, at Ayanapa. And we weren't that far away from Ayanapa. So, so they showed me the spreadsheet on it and like, yeah, we can actually get away with this and still do our tasks and we can, we can send day trips to the guys that are off duty to go to the beach. So that's what we did. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, so, so we would uh, pack up into the vehicle, uh, whoever wasn't on, uh, wasn't on uh, duty that day, and they would get uh, driven out and they had to be picked up by 4, uh, four o'clock uh, later that evening. And uh, so I let that happen, let that take place. It wasn't official, uh, under the caveat that, uh, that I would nail anyone to the wall and ensure that, uh, ensure that this never uh, continued if anybody showed up late for the return trip back. 
and as it turned out, everyone came back each day. So, uh, so, so you know, like we had standards as, as to what the minimum number of people in the platoon were and all that. But by doing that, we, we actually, you know, kept morale up and that sort of thing. Um, it was also the days when, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, you didn't have two beer per person limits. So some soldiers would go, uh, would, uh, go away on leave and come back pretty drunk. And uh, so, you know, you had to enforce discipline in various ways, but the biggest, most important way was to just to make sure that they're okay and take them into their quarters and let them sleep it off. And so long as they weren't drunk when they were on duty, it was okay. And that was the attitude at the time. So just to be clear, you could basically finish your shift in the OP, you're done, you could go drinking for four hours, as long as you're ready for duty the next day you're, you can do that that was exactly the attitude okay. yeah and uh, and you know uh, there might have been instances where soldiers might show up the next morning and still be drunk they would get charged uh, but if you were not on duty it wasn't necessarily a, an issue what about the um the social side uh like in terms of the officers mess what what kind of uh i mean i never went to cyprus but my understanding is that you would take your mess kit, you would have certain social obligations. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, uh, certainly. So, so that was also, uh, like, that was the end of an era of ways of thinking, I think. So, so the, that was, in those days, officers did officer things and soldiers did soldier things. And if you were in the officer corps, you had all these social ob obligations that you had to do. And they were prescribed. And, and we'll be told this, the, uh, the lieutenant that didn't show up. So the, uh, every Tuesday night was a, uh, was a formal mess dinner where you wore your mess kit. Um, every Friday afternoon was a garden party uh, where you wore, uh, they called planter's dress, which is basically a, a white shirt with short sleeves and a, and a tie and uh, trousers. And you had to, uh, and, and these were uh, usually at the mess. They might have been at various embassies. So the entire diplomatic corps, like the whole circuit of the various embassies, they all held these kinds of events. And, uh, and they expected to see the UN officers there too. And uh, so we, of course, obliged. And uh, so these, these were, you know, they were, uh, it, was, it was like the last vestiges of, colon of a colonial lifestyle. And it, it, for me, it was a bit of an issue because I, my platoon was way out in the sticks. Uh, so, you know, there would be times where I would have, have, to, have to figure out a way to get back to my platoon lines after going to these events. And so I would be literally hitching rides for, with uh, various logistical vehicles just so I could make it back to my uh, platoon to actually do my job. And, uh, and, and I eventually I said, okay, that's enough of that. And I had my driver and my driver would just drive me everywhere and, uh, and that sort of thing. And I would just take the risk that, he, that I didn't have a vehicle on the patrol track. But uh, yeah, these were, uh, these were um, typically they were, they were like uh, pool party like events and you would get uh, media personalities there. You'd get various ambassadors. And, and, and of course, as the junior officers, as all young men that we are, we're looking for like, where are all the young women and can we hit them up in the evening? Typical, typical kind of lifestyle for a young soldier. What was it like, uh, you said you had your dad come out. Yeah. What was that like? So, uh, so halfway through I was able to take my leave and, uh, and the reserve, the system was pretty flexible. They simply said, here's, here's what the budget is. So I, I used the budget to fly my dad into Cyprus. So he flew in, and of course Cyprus in those days too was still a, a, a tourist destination. Uh, and uh, it was a nice time of year to be, and uh, so, so Dad flew in, uh, stayed at a hotel. We, we checked in at, at one of the nicer hotels in uh, Nicosia, and, uh, and I showed Dad around the island, and even brought him to my platoon location, and uh, inter introduced him to my, uh, my uh, platoon and the, and the leadership of the platoon. Took him along portions of the Green Line, and uh, so, you know, that's how calm it was. You can bring a family relative into the, into the green, green line. So, uh, so then, uh, and then we uh, took a trip into the Trudos Mountains uh, and, uh, and had rented a little Mazda 323. And uh, we wound up in the middle of nowhere at the top of a hill. And uh, we had bottomed out the vehicle because of ruts and damaged the oil pan and the car broke down. So, uh, so there we were out in the middle of nowhere in the Trudeau Mountains. 
and realized we pulled out a map and saw a village at the at the bottom of the hill. So we rolled the car down into the village, and there was a nice little restaurant. Went in there and asked for some help, and there was a family having a having a, a meal there. Uh, it was kind of like a, a reunion, and uh, and they got to know us. And uh, one of the sons was driving back to Nicosia, so he gave us a lift, and we abandoned the the uh, rental car there. And let the rental agency deal with it. But uh, ended up having a great evening, meeting uh, meeting a Greek Cypriot family, understanding uh, understanding them and their attitudes. And uh, as soon as they learned that I was an officer with with uh, UN Peacekeeping Force, uh, you know, quickly turned to politics and try as we might not to discuss politics. That's what we were doing. And 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 I learned about the visceral distrust that existed, particularly amongst the older generation that remembered all the all the, the atrocities that really happened on the island in the years earlier. What um, is there anything more that you want to say about Cyprus? Uh, no, well, that's yeah, that's, that's kind of I can't think of anything else really. So, what's it like after you know? Again, you're like 21 years old now. You've you commanded a platoon in a, you know an operational theater um, at the time, and then coming back and getting on with your civilian life. What was the transition like? Yeah, well, so there wasn't, there wasn't any sort of gradual transition. It went, it went from, from all army all the time to all student all the time within the span of a week. So I, I returned back to Edmonton uh, in late August. And, my, uh, by, and while I was in Cyprus, I had registered for all my fall semester courses because I was still in third year university. I was actually, I was able to cram most of my fourth year into that fall. Uh, because the the idea of spending an, another a whole year as a university student after doing a, a great adventure like that was just very unappealing, so so I I, I stacked up as many courses as I could in the fall, and uh, so sure enough, uh, wind up back in Edmonton, and back as yet another student at the University of Alberta in September, and uh, and that was that was pretty tough. Like uh, stuff to stay stay focused on the studies. I was relatively disinterested in a lot of the stuff. Felt that I had been there and done so much, that sort of thing. A little bit, a little bit cocky, and uh, and then, but you know, still, still got through the courses. Finished in December, and I was one course short of graduating, which I got done uh, the following spring in a, over in one course. So, but uh, you know that, like, who, how many students can take a year off, go on a UN peacekeeping mission, and still get your degree done, basically within the same time frame as you otherwise would have? Like, what a great opportunity it was. Were you tempted at all to join the regular force? Um, it occurred to me, but but I also saw that you know there is a lot of a lot of not doing things, so it was slow, and uh, and you know this is before before Unprofor, before Bosnia, before all of that. So you know, of course, you can't predict what the future is, and I I just didn't see a see a career in the regular army uh, at the time anyway. This is where I guess I don't I don't I don't want to necessarily go like step by step like with Cyprus, but I'm very curious to know sort of your perception of the of the change now from deploying a, you know like a decade later now going into to Bosnia the workup training and stuff like that and just the now the Canadian Army's approach to these deployments. So can you sort of compare and contrast with Cyprus? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the the biggest change that I know like it was an eight year gap. It was for, I, I went to Cyprus in ninety one to Bosnia in ninety nine. By the time I got to Bosnia, the Canadian Armed Forces and the Army in particular had figured out interna international operations like down to the down to the core down to the letter and uh, and reserves had been well integrated by then so so there was no any inkling of okay you're reserved do you really know what you're doing that sort of thing and uh, and so because they ha there was a it was a huge proven track record of deployment after deployment of like 20 25 percent of the deployment were reserves uh, of all ranks and uh, so so by the time I deployed in in uh, with two RCR uh, to Bosnia in 99 um, you know, it was, yeah, well, another captain here, and uh, here's your job, go to it. And um, so it, there, the workup training was a lot more advanced. Um, the, uh, it was six months of workup training for a six-month tour of duty. And uh, so there was a lot of scenario-based scenario planning, training, that sort of thing, all very specific to our theater of operations, and, uh, and then off we go. Uh, and that was a lot more sophisticated, um, and uh, 
I think in many cases helpful, uh, particularly because the battalions were really undermanned uh, in those days, the, the famous decade of darkness. So the, uh, the tasks were big and, and large. The size of the battalions were a fraction of what the battalions were when I went to Cyprus in 1991. So these turned into composite battalions. So they needed the workup training because they hadn't worked together before. And, uh, and then add in the fact that, in my case, it was about 20% of the troops were, uh, were reserves. Add in the end of that factor, it was, for all intents and purposes, a, a unit that was cobbled together at the last second to deploy. So, uh, so the workup training was important. Uh, so, so I always thought that uh, in a perfect world, they wouldn't need to do the workup training if the unit was at full strength. And, and sure enough, uh, but they did need the training. Still were able to be effective. I didn't really feel that there was any sort of shortcomings in that. The other, the other stuff that I noticed um, going to Bosnia, of course, I, I went into a pretty mature theater again in Bosnia. We had been there since 92. And um, so many of the, the officers and the soldiers there knew Bosnia in worse times. And uh, so it was a pretty relatively calm place. We, had, we were flooded with re refugees from Kosovo, but uh, there wasn't a lot of action, although the remnants of the action was just fresh in everyone's mind. Um, there were war graves and uh, mass grave sites that were all being exhumed by various international bodies and commissions to, to uh, identify, uh, identify the, um, uh, the dead and also to, for, uh, to give closure to uh, locals uh, and that sort of thing. So a lot of identification of, uh, uh, exercises going, going on through all, through all that. So it was still a, a tense place. Uh, everything was mined. And uh, so the, the, the beginnings of these um, international uh, demining commissions, they, they were just starting to get to work, that sort of thing. So it was, uh, so going, thinking of Cyprus, which was a very benign, straightforward UN peacekeeping mission where we kind of knew what our role was and we just did that. And then when we weren't doing the role, we just kind of let, let our hair down. There it was all work all the time. And, uh, and defining our role literally as we're going along as well. You, um, I'm curious, you, you talked about how you thought perhaps the, uh, um, back in the early 90s, the, the standing army was perhaps better trained from, if, from a standing start. Yeah. Did you, do you, is that what you thought? That it was maybe, was it more professional that way or was it more professional in 99? Yeah, so I, I never really thought it was a difference in degree of professionalism. Like the, 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 the quality of the, of the individual soldiers was always, always comparable, always great, regular or reserve, frankly. Um, the, I think the issue was simply the readiness level of the unit. So the unit, the, the unit needed time to get to, to a readiness level because it simply it didn't have the equipment, didn't have the numbers of people or any of that. So when you, uh, when you, cr when you had to co uh, uh, compile all these, these, these units together to get enough to, have, to be what would otherwise be a unit that you should otherwise pick up and just deploy, um, you need the workup training. So that's the, that's the big difference. So the standing army had great training for its day, uh, but the, uh, but the uh, training need by the time the 1990s came around was very uncertain. Cold War was over. So what would a standing army train on? And all those questions were starting to get asked. And uh, so, you know, the days of uh, planning for, uh, for to defend against the, the Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, army coming across Eastern Europe, well, that was never considered a viable likelihood. But nothing had necessarily been put into its place by then. So your job now is to uh, do public affairs. What, what, what sort of, what were your responsibilities and what, is there something, well just what were your responsibilities and what was it like dealing with the media? So yeah, so the responsibilities were really simple. Um, uh, promote uh, what, why we're there to Canadians. So, uh, so uh, work with Canadian media and, uh, and where possible set up interviews, that sort of thing. And, uh, and also, uh, and also um, uh, escort and, and provide uh, key messaging and set up uh, interviews uh, with senior leadership for international media that might come into the, the theatre. 
So, you know, it was really very, very responsive. We had a good understanding of what our key messaging would be. And, uh, and it was all about uh, supporting the, uh, the Dayton Peace Accords, uh, enforcing the rules of the Peace Accords, that sort of thing. And then, sh and then showing what we were doing and, uh, and letting, uh, letting the media draw their own conclusions. So, uh, so we had a couple of media tours. Uh, one was a group of Canadian media that came and uh, it was in the middle of the uh, refugee crisis. So we took them to the various re refugee, refugee camps. And, uh, and you know, it, it was spring in, in, in uh, the Balkans, very wet, very muddy, conditions were very poor. And the journalists' eyes all were opened as to, you know, what the level of, of, uh, of destitution that many refugees had. And these, the refugees were like professionals. There were doctors, dentists, lawyers, and of course, uh, people from all walks of life. And yet they were living in destitution. All, only because they needed to pack up and leave uh, uh, at the last second. So, uh, so the camps uh, were rudimentary at best. You had various UN organizations, United, UNHCR and Medicine Sans Frontieres providing support, but it was still pretty harsh conditions. So a lot of the journalists focused on that because it was such a, such a topical issue at the time, less, less on the actual stability operations that we were doing. But uh, meanwhile, you know, there's still there were still meetings that you had to deal with, with the various factions. You had to visit uh, weapons, uh, weapons caches, containment sites, as they called them, to make sure that they were all, all the weapons were inventory, that they weren't being sold on the black market, that sort of stuff. How, uh, looking back, how sophisticated was the Army's public affairs uh, setup at that time? Well, it couldn't have been sophisticated if they had an infantry officer doing the public affairs. <laughs> So, uh, so it, it was pretty, you know, like the, the Army always had public affairs officers through that era, but it wasn't very sophisticated in the sense that, you know, they really knew what they wanted to, what messaging they wanted to have. A lot of that was just done on the fly. And, uh, and you know, my approach was very, was very open uh, to show that, you know, there's nothing to hide here. And if this is what you want to see, then we'll take you there to see it. And here's, here's some basic rules, and the rules aren't about... Uh, hiding information from you. The rules are about your safety. And so, so you know, don't walk over there. It's probably a minefield, that sort of thing. So, uh, so the public affairs uh, uh, as a function was really just find a guy to babysit the journalists. And, and, then, and then it, would, it depended on the level of, uh, of um, initiative that that public affairs officer would have uh, and to what effect he would get. So comparing this to this to our public affairs officer uh, to being a platoon commander in Cyprus, which how satisfying was this first tour in Bosnia for you? Uh, well, it was still satisfying because it was a very different uh, different environment, and and you felt that you're actually helping in a different way, albeit more indirect. There's there's nothing to be compared to when you're in a command position because you actually get to affect things more directly. Um, so as a public affairs officer, I felt that I was just kind of you know, just another staff officer. So it wasn't all that personally gratifying in that sense. But it was also pretty, but it was gratifying in the sense that, you know, we, like I would often be able to take journalists out and show them an interesting piece uh, about what we were doing and why it was worthwhile and get a very favorable article out of them and, and that sort of thing. In fact, I even got to, I even wrote a column for the Fredericton Daily Gleaner, the home newspaper for uh, 2RCR, that every week I'd write a column and they would publish. And, uh, and, and you know, that was rewarding as well because I got to communi communicate to Canadians exactly what we were doing and why. I'm just curious, uh, from a personal standpoint, can you make any generalizations about serving with the Patricias, serving with the Royals, in terms of regimental culture between the two? Yes, it is definitely diff different regimental culture. The, uh, so it's uh, so two RCR. You could people would argue that two RCR is even different than uh, than one RCR, and so two RCR uh, they they still hold on to their uh, their uh, connection to the Black Watch, uh, which I found quite quite interesting. The mess life, um, the uh, both both the Patricias are very Western Canadian kind of uh, very cowboy, uh, almost anti aristocratic. Uh, in that sense, and the, and the RCR are like totally, they buy right into the whole officership, that sort of thing. And, and I'm not making a judgment on it, it's just a very different different way of looking at it. 
I, I felt very welcome and uh, welcome in both battalions. So it, they uh, different styles and different uh, different emphasis. But uh, so the Patricias loved their. Uh, this is the days when PPCLI were in Calgary, so everything was Western oriented. They even had a wagon wheel on the on the roof on the ceiling of their mess. Uh, whereas the RCR, it was like going going into a British. Uh, officers mess, particularly uh, at their home station in Gagetown. So very, you know, very different kinds of culture, uh, and they would define their morale differently in the sense that, you know, some so, uh, some would take their ceremonial role more seriously than others, um, that sort of thing. But both, uh, in both cases, when I de uh, when I deployed with them, you know, I I quickly got into the mess life of the battalion. And uh, and you know that's uh, that just turns into a you know a very tight family. Um, any any day stand out? Any incident stand out for you this this tour? Well, one tour of with the media was particularly uh, uh, funny, in the sense that uh, so there was a uh, we had a radio rebroadcast site at the top of a mountain that just overlooked Behatch. The base of that mountain was uh, where Tito had his. Um, had his air force, and they they were they were basically built caves. Where they put their uh, their planes into those caves, and the cave and they had uh, they had um, passageways that went all the way up the inside of the mountains. Fascinating place, and uh, almost like a like a like a movie. And uh, but at the top was this radio rebroadcast site, and uh, so we th we thought we'd take the journalists there and kind of show them the mountain as well. So we showed them the mountain. They thought that was very interesting, and then we drove we drove to the top of the mountain. And it was the day before they were all to get on their planes to fly home. And uh, it was early spring when they were there, and a uh, weather system came in and snowed us in. And uh, so we ended up spending an extra, extra, uh, extra eight hours there. And, uh, and the uh, journalists were like beside themselves, are we going to get, catch our flight home, that sort of thing. And uh, so eventually the, uh, the snow, snow stopped snowing. And the visibility was good, and we had a BV-206 at the top, and uh, you know, old, uh, basically, uh, fiberglass-bodied uh, uh, snow vehicle. So we piled into the BV-206, and down we went. And uh, the uh, the driver accidentally uh, uh, slid the vehicle into the side of the mountain. So on the one, on the left-hand side, on the way down, was a drop of like a very long cliff and then on the right hand side was the wall of the mountain and you're driving down this so he slid accidentally slid into the wall of the mountain and he and and he had to go back go back and forth uh, to get out and as he was doing so the rock of the mountain was tearing apart the side of the bv206 it was just fiberglass next thing you know this rock is coming through the uh, through the back of the uh, 206, right where the uh, these these two journalists are sitting, and and this this one woman, she's she's like in tears and falling apart, and we're trying to console her and keep her calm, and you know it's it's yeah it was a little bit scary, but at the same time it was pretty pretty straightforward. So anyway, um, we got out of that, and then then they're driving, and then the BV 206 just stopped, and just stopped, and obviously he was he was stopping just to look at the map and figure something out, but we're in the back, we don't see it, we're just in this box. And then one of the journalists who had a pretty uh, dark sense of humor said, I think we're in free fall. And all of the journalists there just burst into tears. It was, uh, it was quite funny. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, oh brother. And uh, so eventually we made it down to the bottom of the mountain. Of course it was raining at the bottom of the mountain, it was snow up the top. And, uh, and so they all pile out of the out, out of the, the thing and uh, out of the vehicle, and the um, the uh, couple of photographers got positioned themselves, and all of the TV journalists just knelt on the ground and kissed the earth. <laughs> um, your your last tour in Bosnia, or your, your second one. What what were you doing then? What was your role, and what was it like compared to the previous two? Yeah, so uh, so that was kind of a cool tour because I got to see some of the fruits of the previous la labor of the other tour that happened four years prior. So I went in two thousand two and deployed as a major in that case, and I was the liaison officer from one of the sectors to the headquarters of the stabilization force in uh, in Sarajevo, 
So, uh, so there, uh, I worked in the operations center uh, and the, uh, the combined operations center. So for for all all the arms, and uh, and my job was just basically represent the the general who commanded the sector that that, that the Canada, uh, UK, uh, Dutch sector, commanded by at the time was a Dutch general, and then he, and then a British uh, general took over. And uh, the, uh, so my job was to help plan any of the operations that would happen in their sector if, they were, if, the, if the division was doing any, anything and they needed, uh, they needed resources, I would be the liaison guy to ask for those resources at the higher headquarters, that sort of thing. So, uh, so I got to see a lot of the more strategic level stuff. My boss, uh, the assistant chief of staff, not my boss, but the, the assistant chief of staff of operations at the headquarters was then Brigadier General David Petraeus, who later went on to much bigger things. And uh, so it was kind of neat working for people like that. And, uh, and you know, you got to see kind of how, what the big picture issues were and what they wanted to focus on. And in that headquarters, it was almost exclusively uh, war crimes. And uh, uh, because it was a relatively calm, the, the Bosnia was beginning to stabilize. The economy was getting back to normal. And so you got to see all of that, and that was actually good for the psyche. It made, made you feel better. Uh, it made you feel that you're actually achieving stuff. And uh, the uh, the uh, focus of most of the operations, because it was uh, war crimes related, actually served a lot of purposes at the at, from the Bosnian civilian level, because inevitably those that were committing the war crimes, they were also organized criminals. So you you got to you actually killed two birds with one stone, if you will. By that time, how uh, can you speak about how can the Canadian troops abroad, in Bosnia in this case, were regarded by their international peers? Did you ever get any sense of that? Yeah, it was especially uh, especially in my uh, tour, in my second tour, because at the NATO headquarters, you had um, 32 different countries represented uh, uh, as as officers. So. The Canadians were always uh, the ones that were involved in the in the in the in the uh, both uh, re well regarded as the operational troops, the ones that involved in the planning. If you needed something to get done, you would go to the Canadians. Or, you know, arguably you'd say that to, about the Americans and the British as well. It was very clearly the American, British, Canadian troops were the ones that you, you the the entire force would rely on the most. Uh, well respected, uh, the Germans and the French, of course, are well respected as well. But they, you know, they um, they they looked at Canadians as like, well, you guys have been done this for a long time. You know what you're doing. Uh, they were those armies are relatively new to this kind of a theater operations. So um, so by and large, at all levels, Canadian troops were uh, were well respected. I remember having conversations with various officers, and when they learned that I was a, a reserve officer, they were astonished. And they're thinking, well, how can you be a reserve officer? You're doing this kind of stuff. Uh, they thought, you know, in their armies, only regular army officers would do it. Is there a, an incident that's memorable from that tour stands out for you? Yeah, it's kind of a, it's, it, it's, uh, it was, a, it was an operation that I got to, didn't really get to participate much in, aside from uh, some phone calls, really, as a liaison officer. But I got to see it unfold in the operations center. So it was a, it was a snatching of a war criminal. So we got intelligence that a particular war criminal was uh, uh, had established a pattern of life, and we found found out where he would be going, and where we would expect him. And and he was being watched in Banja Luka, and quickly learned that uh, he would be in a in a cafe, typically at a particular time of day, and uh, and um, so we uh, we planned the operation to capture him and, and uh, detain him and send him off to the Hague. And involved helicopters, all the rest of it. Like it, was, it was a very interesting operation without going into a lot of detail. But he, make, the, make a long story short, we captured him and some hapless person that was sitting at his table and, uh, and flew him to a, to a location, uh, con confirmed his identity, uh, confirmed that the, identi the identity of the other person was, was not somebody that we were interested in, and so the question came back to our headquarters, well, what do we do with this other guy? And uh, the British uh, colonel in charge of the operations just kind of shook his head, looked at the ceiling and said, oh, for Christ's sakes, just fly him back to where we got him, kick him out the door and give him a bar's bar and tell him to have a nice day. 
<laughs> so that's what we did. We, I don't know if we gave him a Mars bar, but we just took him back and sent him on his way. So this poor hapless guy just suddenly had a weird four or five hours in, of his afternoon taken from him. How do you think, looking at all these experiences, how, how have they uh, affected or shaped you as a person, uh, as a soldier? Yeah. Well, as a, as a soldier, it's, it's certainly given me a much more professional development. I feel a hell of a lot more confident as a, as a commanding officer of a unit. The, uh, you know, I can, uh, I can converse with any officer uh, in any army and, uh, and speak the same language, if you will. And, uh, and I also have the confidence to do, to do the job. So, so there, there's that piece. For, so from a professional development uh, perspective, there's nothing like a tour of duty to not just inject confidence, but also inject relevant knowledge. Uh, personally, uh, I just love the fact that I've been able to have great adventures, uh, all, all of which were while doing interesting and important things. So like I always view, uh, I'm, I'm that, uh, I've, I view the idea of, of a classical liberal arts education where you, know, you get exposed to many things and, uh, and it just helps you in, in every other aspect. My civilian career has benefited from all of the military experience I've had and in particular the operations. So it just gives you a well-rounded view of life. Any, um, any regrets that you didn't get to go to Afghanistan? Yeah, there's, there's always, I, I think anybody who's uh, in uniform has a de burning desire to deploy on the most interesting operations, and certainly Afghanistan is one of the most interesting. So I feel that uh, th there's a part of me that feels that I wish I had better better opportunity to step up and do so. Not to say the opportunity wasn't there, but it wasn't there for me to take uh, at that stage of my life. Um, I, I still feel that I've given a positive contri contribution. There was various roles that I played at home. And, uh, and I'm always proud of the troops that have gone. And knowing that, that also m I'm still driven to do another deployment. So, uh, and, uh, and hopefully I will get to do another one in the future sometime. Could we um, just talk a little bit about your regiment and, and uh, I guess the toll Afghanistan took on several soldiers in this regiment. What, what was the impact uh, of those deaths on uh, the people here, on, on you? Yeah, so um, it's one of the t uh, few topics that really hits me hard emotionally uh, because the, uh, the guys that we lost were actually quite young, early stages of their, their life. And, uh, you know, so the, the, the adage that, uh, that war and conflict, you lose the best and the brightest, you certainly do, and, that, and that's hard. Uh, it's, hard on the, it's hard on the troops and their unit. It's hard on the families, uh, all of it. So, uh, so there's, that, uh, there's that sense of remorse which comes back uh, every, uh, you know, at every major milestone, frankly. And, uh, you know, so it, it was a kick in the teeth to lose troops. We lost three. And, uh, and, and, and several others came home very seriously wounded. Uh, and, and, and they're disabled as a result. The, um, so that, that experience injected a lot of seriousness into our unit. And I think that was the case across the entire, entire Canadian Armed Forces. Um, and with the reserves, it, it, it injected that level of gravitas at the unit because we were the ones that would, uh, that would deal with the after effects of losing, losing soldier. So we were the ones that would take the call, talk to the family, bring, bring the, the body home, all of that. So there was always that, this somber feeling in the unit whenever, whenever this would happen. And, uh, and so when milestones uh, happen, like uh, Remembrance Day, that sort of thing, you know, it, it affects the mood. Um, and of course, you know, sadly today we have Memorial Cross uh, mothers that are very young, and that's sad. Is there anything that I haven't asked you? Yeah. Um, you want to say? Let me think. Just about the whole, the whole story. So yeah, no, not not really. Like uh, one of the things I would want to say is, whenever you put on the uniform and you join, you join to do stuff, and operations is the stuff that you want to do. So uh, so simply putting on a uniform and not doing that from my perspective, is weird. So uh, I can't imagine not having the desire to go somewhere again, uh, so long as I'm in uniform. Whether or not I go may be rain to be seen, 
and always have that burning, burning desire. What do you tell the young soldiers under your command now about what kind of advice do you give them in that, with, in that regard? Well, uh, yeah, in fact, I, a couple of things that I make a point of telling, uh, telling young soldiers when they're talking to me about their future. Uh, one is I, I ask them the question, uh, are you w ready and willing to go into combat? Is that something that, you, that you've thought about? And are, you are, you, are you capable of it? Uh, not, all, not all soldiers can ask, necessarily answer the question. I don't have an expectation that you, they can answer it. Absolutely, definitely, yes, sir. But, uh, but I do want them to think about it because that opportunity, that reality is, is there. And the last several years of, Af uh, of Afghanistan brought that home very starkly and very clearly. And uh, so there's, there's that piece to it. But also, uh, are, you, are you willing to deploy? Do you want to do this? Why are you in the Army? And, uh, and if it's anything other than, uh, than, to, uh, than, to, than to contribute to uh, the goals of the Army, you have to ask, the, ask them the question, are you here for all the right reasons? This is, I'm not suggesting that every soldier has to be noble. Uh, not at all. In fact, most, most soldiers, and myself included, join the Army out of more of a, a sense of adventurism. Pa patriotism comes later. That's great. Thanks very much. Okay.